Chapter 1. Our Comprehension is Subjective Most of us have very strong opinions about political matters, but I'll now explain that no one sees things as they really are, and no one has all the answers. Not even me. For example, the question that matters the most to me is, how can we all learn to live together in peace? If anyone had a complete answer to that question, then we'd already have peace. Clearly we're not there yet. But wait, you say. If only everyone would listen to my answer, we'd have peace. Well, you might be right about that. But how will you get everyone to listen to your answer? Knowing how to do that is a crucial part of the answer, and none of us has found that part yet. It can't be separated from the rest of the answer, because peace requires consensus. It can't be forced on people. It would be nice to find a magic phrase that would switch on a light in people's heads, and then they'd tell their friends, who would tell their friends, and so on, like some sort of chain reaction, and by next morning the whole world would be enlightened. But none of us has found that holy grail of political understanding yet. Even Buddha and Jesus never found a way to spread their teachings to everyone. And by the way, I haven't found a way to get everyone to read this essay or watch this video. But if you like it, please recommend it to other people. We don't all agree on what the solutions are. In fact, we haven't even agreed on what the problems are. Why do we have so many different opinions about that? And why do we feel so certain in our opinions? Among other things, certainty feels good. Most of our society is uncomfortable with uncertainty and so we seek reassurance from dogma. Buddha recommended accepting some uncertainty in our lives, just as a surfer accepts the uncertainty of the waves. I like to imagine Buddha as a surfer. He'd have been totally rad, dude. But another ingredient in our excessive certainty is the notion of objective reality, which has been a basic part of our culture ever since the 18th century when Isaac Newton explained the trajectories of the heavenly bodies. Physics has made great breakthroughs in recent centuries. We had people walking on the moon, and our cell phones are really cool gadgets. And so we've gotten used to the idea that we should try to understand all of reality the way that we understand physics. Physics has moved on since the 18th century, but only in ways that are difficult to apply to everything else and so politics and economics are still very much based on Newton's 18th century attitudes about objective reality. Science fiction author Philip K. Dick said, Reality is that which, when you stop believing in it, doesn't go away. But I'll show you that ob objectivity is overrated. I think this is part of what linguist George Lakoff was trying to say when he said, that you can't understand 21st century politics with an 18th century brain. Here's an example. Consider a shooting. On the surface, it appears to be an objective, concrete fact of physics. A bullet from one man's gun enters the other man's body. But how we feel about the event, how we react to it, depends on how we interpret its significance. Was it self-defense? Murder? Part of a justified war? part of an unjustified war? And what about the man's family and friends? And so on. For questions of that sort, answers can't be objective and absolute. Any answers can only be formulated in terms of the models and frames and vocabulary through which we interpret the world. It turns out that the methods of physics can only be applied to the objects of physics. That is, simple, dead, concrete objects. And why do these objects seem concrete to us, rather than abstract? Maybe it's because we all experience these objects in the same way. That is, because we have found a vocabulary in which we can describe a common experience. Politics is not concrete, perhaps just because we haven't yet figured out what is our common experience in politics, and how to describe it. We humans can only understand reality through models. But any model of reality is simpler than reality itself, and therefore must be somewhat unrealistic. A naive version of Buddhism would urge us to try to see the world directly as it is, without the interposition of any models and interpretations. 
but that would leave us as helpless as a newborn babe. And models are useful. Without their filtering, we would be swamped with excessive data. For instance, when I'm trying to drive somewhere, I'd rather have a road map than an aerial photograph, just because the map contains less data. Rather than see without models, I think a wiser goal is just the opposite, to try to become familiar with many models, to apply each as appropriate, and in this fashion to avoid being dependent upon and misled by any one of them. But most of us have just a few models for politics, and it's not always the same few. We're in disagreement about them. For instance, people may have different notions about what constitutes a war, or about which wars are justified. The people who see things differently from us may appear to us to be evil, stupid, or crazy. We might say, you can't reason with those people. And they may see us that way, too. But those people are too numerous to ignore, and they aren't going away. So we'd better keep trying to understand them, to understand how to heal our culture. Our understanding is shaped by our language, among other things. A word in one language may be considered a translation of a word in another language. But the translation is never perfect. There are always slight differences in the meanings. In fact, even if you and I ostensibly speak the same language, we'll still have slightly different meanings for a word. That's inevitable, because we learned the word in different contexts, with different associations, in different childhoods. Words carry with them our different assumptions about how the world works. And in some cases, the differences are quite large. For instance, one of Lakoff's books is devoted to how liberals and conservatives have very different meanings for the word freedom. And which model is best? For instance, which meaning for the word war yields the most helpful understanding of wars? Perhaps it's really none of them that we've found yet. Perhaps we would get a better understanding of wars from some other slightly different definition that no one has devised yet. Words and phrases are not neutral carriers of information. Whoever chooses the language will win the debate. George Orwell dramatized that in several ways in his novel 1984. For instance, the Ministry of Peace was the branch of government that concerned itself with war. Coincidentally, just a few weeks after Orwell's novel was published, the United States Department of War was renamed as the Department of Defense thereby making it easier for people of the USA to believe that all U.S. wars are good wars. By itself, a euphemism is a blunt instrument, but euphemisms are very effective when used as part of a broader propaganda system. Here are a few euphemisms to watch out for. Terrorist generally means a poor person who is fighting in self-defense. I'll talk more about that one in a later chapter. Enhanced interrogation means torture. Rendition means kidnapping. Detention means imprisonment without trial. Defense usually means war. Our war usually means our government's war. A national border is an imaginary line drawn on a map by a politician who wants to say those people are not like us. And really, a foreigner is just a cousin. The words settler and settlement give the impression of building on land that was uninhabited, but generally it's only uninhabited because you've removed the previous inhabitants. And the place you put those previous inhabitants might be called a reservation, but that's just a nice word for concentration camp. And that removal process is sometimes called ethnic cleansing, which used to be a euphemism for genocide, but it's no longer much of a euphemism. The disguise has worn through. National interests usually means the interests of the several multinational corporations that own our government. Free trade really means exploit the hell out of anyone who is desperate, a system that increases the gap between rich and poor. And consequently, free enterprise really means plutocracy. Concessions means cuts in wages and benefits. Property rights are always selectively enforced, and so the phrase really means property rights for the rich. 
For instance, do you see anyone protecting your water or your chromosomes from the poisonous runoff of strip mining? And here's the really big one. God really means whatever you've been told to believe about God. These euphemisms remind me of how Morpheus described the Matrix to Neo. It is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. A euphemism generally is just a word or phrase, but framing or models may be much broader and deeper. They give us an entire worldview. When we change how we see the world, it changes everything we do. Francis Moore LaPay has explained how we need to go from looking at the world as a spiral of powerlessness to looking at the possibilities of a spiral of empowerment. I'll say more about that later in this essay. We humans are not very imaginative, and it's seldom that any of us discovers or invents a new way of seeing things, a new word or concept, a new model or part of a model. There are few Einsteins in physics where precision is possible, and even fewer in sociology where precision is not possible. Einstein's research papers were not thick reams of long computations, working out new consequences of well-known ideas. In fact, his research papers were fairly short, and included only a few computations. His brilliance was mostly in his nonconformity, his extraordinary ability to think outside the box. Our Indo-European languages prejudice us to think about time and space in certain ways, but Einstein got outside those ways, and thought in directions that had never occurred to his predecessors. The models presented in a college course in philosophy may not be sufficient for the needs of our present world, and at any rate most of us have never taken such a course. And our corporate communications media offer us only a very narrow range of interpretations of events. Because we humans can only see reality through our unrealistic models, we can be sure that none of us is seeing things exactly as they really are. Not even me. But it's easy for us to forget that, because our modern way of life is making it increasingly easy for us to live in an echo chamber, to mainly have conversations with people whose views are much like our own. At this point in the transcript, I'm including links to some material about that by Bill Bishop and Eli Pariser. That echo chamber phenomenon is rather unfortunate because, as I mentioned earlier, one of the main things we need is consensus. We all have to understand one another better. To get other people to listen to you more, you're going to have to understand those people a lot better. Perhaps you'll achieve that by listening to them more. The knowledge that we're all seeking includes an understanding of each other, and that can only be found in conversation. We need to dig deeper than just issues and policies. We need to become articulate about our own values and feelings, and the values and feelings of those around us. So I disagree with the people who say, we've had enough talk, it's time for action. Talk, if it is productive, is the most important kind of action. Be patient in conversation. After all, what is obvious to one person is not obvious to another, and even that fact is not obvious to some people. In most conversations, if other people don't understand you, it's probably not for lack of trying, and if you don't understand them, probably that's not their intention either. And even if the person you're talking with is stupid, saying so won't help. Though our knowledge and understanding may grow, they will never be complete. Nevertheless, we have a duty to act upon whatever we have become reasonably certain about. And yet, the more we act on our beliefs, the more we feel committed to them, because we don't want to believe we've made a mistake. Thus, the more readily we blind ourselves to other views. We are less objective than most of us realize. Psychologist Jonathan Haidt wrote that, When we think we're being scientists, quite often we're actually acting like lawyers. That is, we're not trying to discover the truth, but trying to prove our case. So another of our duties is to constantly struggle for self-awareness, to be aware of our feeling of commitment and how it may be biasing us. 
How clearly do we see ourselves or see others? We almost always see good motives for our own actions, but we may imagine bad motives when other people carry out the same actions. That's the basis of American exceptionalism, the belief that the USA can do no wrong. It might help if more of us studied psychology. People who understand their own nature are more likely to choose its better parts. For instance, at this point in the transcript, I'm inserting links to information about Milgram's obedience experiment and Zimbardo's prison experiment and Ron Jones's third wave experiment. People who read about those experiments are then less likely to succumb to the moral pitfalls those revealed. We are not very bright, so we rarely learn the basic truths of our own nature. But we unlearn them even more rarely, so the long-term trend is in the right direction. Few of us can become experts on something, and none of us can become experts on everything. So we all must rely on others for their expertise. But the experts disagree with each other. How do we choose among them? I think mostly we choose those whose views and alliances are consistent with the views and alliances we already have. We all have different trusted sources for what we believe to be factual information and meaningful models. And trust can't be won through debate. But sometimes it can be achieved through dialogue. We must strive to at least hear the people with whom we disagree, just in case we hear something unexpected. By the way, here in the transcript are links to my own favorite trusted sources. Alternet, Common Dreams, Democracy Now!, and the Greenville Post.